so long as we're going to be here, it's really important that we do our part. Miami's a beautiful place. We don't want it to be impacted by sea level rise. And rice is important for a number of different reasons. It's the sole source of calories for almost two billion people in the world. When we talk about honeybees, we're talking about pollination. One third to one half of all of the food on our plates is grown thanks to the labor of the honeybee. What we're trying to communicate is that sea level rise is not an issue that we need to deal with in the future. It's something we need to deal with right now in terms of developing solutions to address sea level rise. Um, and so with these events, these citizen science flood reporting events, uh, we use the king tide as an opportunity to bring people out of their homes to observe the flooding and also participate in solutions, which is uh, in collecting information that will help us to better understand the impacts of sea level rise locally. So long as we're going to be here, it's really important that we do our part in making sure that the, that the data gets collected, that the people who are working on this problem have a real reason to move forward and, and if you have all the data then you can really sort of make projections and figure out what's going on so I want to do my part for the city and um, Miami's a beautiful place we don't want it to be impacted by sea level rise in the way that the projections are sort of um, putting out there so we, we want to do our part to make sure that that folks who are in the know and who, who are able to build a plan have the, the data that they need. Yeah, Who's ready to take some samples? Yay! Yeah. So I'm a consultant. I advise cities on sea level rise planning, um, and one of the things we talk a lot about is the importance of citizen science. And so, this was my first opportunity to actually get my hands dirty and do it myself. Put the filter on the syringe. The filter. It is a manpower thing because you simply can't cover the number of sites that we're working on today uh, with the research infrastructure that we have at, um, at our disposal. But I want to say that it's just as important to, to engage people in this way so that we can communicate the issues of sea level rise. That it's, okay, there you go. Yeah, if that's at zero when you put okay. fresh water, then it's calibrated. Oh. Yeah. I've probably seen it, of course, but I haven't paid attention because I didn't even, I didn't know what was it, what was it about, that sea comes and, and get floating in the, in the middle of the street. So yeah, now we know. I, I think, even for myself, I don't think I really appreciated how urgent the issue of sea level rise was until I saw the water coming out of the drain and it just doesn't stop. It just continues and it continues to come out and the, the area that's being inundated by flood becomes larger and larger. And until you see that really you know, dynamic aspect of the flooding, I think it's difficult to really understand what's going on around us. When Irma came across the Keys, it, the eye came across the Keys about 20 miles east of here, so just up the Keys. This mooring field here was devastation. There were boats up in the mangroves throughout here. Uh, many of the boats were on their sides or upside down or on the docks. Even just a little bit of mangrove can make a big difference. It, it made all the difference in the world for our marina, I'm, I'm convinced of it. We, we know that, that mangroves provide a physical buffer. They literally wring the energy out of waves when the waves pass through them. They literally break the wake uh, or the wind and they can, or if you have enough of them, they can actually provide this sort of a sponge effect to literally soak up some of the water before it gets too much further uh, through them. You know, this is not a seed. A lot of people think this is a seed. This is actually a fully germ, this, this is a seedling. And this is the actual bud. This is called the terminal bud. 
And so this one is actually a pretty good example of a you know, viable seedling. It's natural protection against storm surge. It's natural protection against erosion. It keeps all of the sediment and the shoreline intact. And then once they're fully mature, they also provide you know, this really vibrant ecosystem for juvenile fish, crustaceans, birds, all sorts of native species that's also beaches and dunes, but it's also the coral reefs that sit further offshore. So it's a multi-layered sort of system of natural infrastructure that can actually protect us. We can take a large boulder coral, fragment into a lot of small coin-sized pieces, increase their growth, and then fuse them back together to create a larger coral colony than we started with in a fraction of the time. It's called the coral gardening process. And it's a great, simple, effective way to create a lot of coral from small amounts initially. Coral is important for a number of different reasons. First and foremost, it protects our communities. It provides us with food and shelter, and it's the main reef building structure that marine organisms rely on for their habitat, their livelihood. You could cut this right. and put it on a paired thing. Just recently these events, these natural coral bleaching events are becoming more and more common, more and more severe, and we just lost over the last couple of years almost 50% of the corals on the Great Barrier Reef, for example, as, as a result of this worldwide spread of coral bleaching. We're interested in trying to leverage this great effort to restore reefs using these coral species by actually just trying to figure out if there's a way that we can make them more heat tolerant, more stress tolerant. So that instead of planting out the next set of coral victims, we're actually planting out corals that we think are going to be more heat tolerant uh, in the future. Despite having been uh, really severely bleached uh, just a couple of months ago, they've actually recovered really well. And you can see that they've started to grow new branches. Where you see that sort of growing white tip, is active calcification kind of shooting forwards, and then the algae, which is this yellowish brown color, uh, slowly kind of catching up from the rest of the colony. It's a question of communicating what we've lost, but also communicating what we still have to lose, and trying some of these novel methodologies to try to intervene and, and boost the chances of survival for these ecosystems. To date, we've outplanted over 11,000 corals back onto local reefs, each site varying from a couple hundred to a couple thousand. We can't rebuild every reef around the globe, so that's why education is the, the second biggest part of our program and our efforts. Keep in mind that it's more than just people it is going to affect all living things because all living things depend on plants as a food source. seed isn't even any moisture. Well, the Earth's climate has been changing over millions of years, but we've never seen this much change over a hundred years. So we're living in a warmer world, we're living in a melting world, we're living in a world where sea levels are rising. The fact is that the warming we are seeing now in recent decades is human caused. It's not natural. If it weren't for human activities, the world under natural causes like changes in the sun and volcanoes would have actually cooled slightly in recent decades, and yet it's been warming. And the war warming is due to human activities primarily to carbon dioxide and other heat trapping gases and particles that mankind has put into the atmosphere. We're using the atmosphere as a free dump for the waste products of an energy system based on coal and oil and natural gas, and that is causing the planet to warm up. We're quite sure of that. And so the thing that worries me the most is not the next thousand years or the next ice age, but the next hundred years.
We're here to drill an ice core to the bedrock. Minus 28 there, and um, just come in and look to your right, you'll see an ice core, I think. Yeah. So this ice comes from 754 meters down, and it's on the order of uh, 6,000 years old. The snow that we're getting in this ice core didn't fall at this spot, because this is an ice stream that's moving, so this snow fell some hundreds of kilometers away from here, and it's moved to this spot. At this depth, we can still see one year to the next, to the next, to the next. So when we study the climate, we're actually getting information um, for every year. Uh, so we get the seasonal signals and dust and water isotopes and other impurities that tell us about atmospheric circulation. They tell us about the temperature. Uh, they tell us about processes in the ocean. And, um, and then the bubbles will give us the concentrations of uh, constituents of the atmosphere, methane, carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide. So we are pulling these cores out and the bubbles have 60 times atmospheric pressure, then the ice can't hold it. So it becomes explosive. So it, it starts to crack on the table spontaneously and, and, and all the gases ex escape. And as a driller and scientist, it kind of breaks your heart when you do all this, you get these beautiful cylinders out, yeah. you put it on the table and then it starts to just pop, 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 pop. You can, you can hear it like Rice Krispies. And that's what we call a brittle zone. And it's really, really terrible as a glaciologist to watch this perfect core disintegrate in front of your eyes. So we actually, and this is, it sounds completely ridiculous and backwards, but actually we mounted a freezer unit in a snow cave inside the Greenland ice sheet. And, uh, and that's simply to control the temperature. We say, everybody would say, oh, it must be cold in there. Yes, but it's not cold enough, so we are putting a freezer inside the ice sheet. And that, that, that's, that's hilarious. But anyhow, anyway, so we know the Greenland now is shrinking because there's enhanced melting around the sides. Very easy to understand because it corresponds to rising temperatures at the coastline. So you will have much more runoff. And that will make the Greenland ice sheet lose mass. So right now, I think the contribution of Greenland ice sheet to world sea level change is just beginning to show. But we don't know if this shrinking is going to be a linear straightforward process that you can predict. And that's why we are drilling at, uh, at East Grip. You can monitor the surface. Trouble is, all kinds of funny stuff is going on at the base of the ice sheet. If something odd is going on at the base in these ice streams, and there are a lot of ice streams in Western Antarctica too, then it can upset the entire apple cart. All of a sudden you would have an unstable ice sheet that might break away, not over several centuries, but over a couple of decades. And that would be disastrous. Now we know that CO2 is plant food. We think there's a dilution effect as the plants become bigger with more CO2. There's an imbalance between all the additional carbon in the air and the soil nutrients that are not compensating for all that additional carbon. So what happens is that carbon to uh, nutrient variation goes up. So we think there's a dilution effect. But there's also some other things that are happening. Plants become more efficient under high CO2. And so their need for nitrogen, uh, which is an important nutrient, may be less. But they're bigger, so they may require it. So there's some change in there as well in terms of physiology and function that may be affecting the nutritional status as well. In addition, there are also changes in terms of the water flow through the plant and all the nutrients that go with the water flow. Uh, basically, as you give the plants more CO2, the pores in the leaf the, that are called stomates tend to, to become smaller, they shrink, uh, in size, and so the water evaporative loss of water is less, and therefore the nutritional movement through from the soil to the plant is less, and that may also be impacting overall micronutrient uh, concentration. Rice was going to respond, and rice is important for a number of different reasons, but uh, one of the primary reasons is that it's the sole source of calories for almost two billion people in the world. 
And so whatever happens to rice is going to have a big impact on, on the global community. So looking at how CO2 was going to affect rice, looking at how it was going to uh, impact nutrition, growth, uh, trying to find out which variety of rice is going to respond, uh, what are the implications in terms of culture, what are the implications in terms of food, and so on. There's so many really cool questions associated with that and that intersection between climate change, CO2, and, and rice biology. Each student is environmentally conscious. And so through Ecology Club and the use of our gardens, students become conscious of how butterflies and how the garden um, help our environment. Come on out, Ecology Club members. The Ecology Club has been in existence probably about 14 years out of the 15 years that I've been here. And we're quite active. That other sweet potato here, and then maybe another one here. We talk about um, the need for a certain plant for an, a, an organism to survive. Um, we talk about the cycles because we've got, got eggs, we've got a, our larva, caterpillar, and then we've got this chrysalis, and then they're waiting patiently for it to emerge. And every day it's, it's an adventure and a discovery because there's so much that we see. We had a butterfly bush in my house off the side of my deck, and we actually had to cut it down when we built our deck, and I missed it so much, and I loved looking at all the butterflies, and I was like, wow, well, we have a decreased population in our area, and I thought, oh, well, I can fix that. So I developed this idea, and Miss Denise supported me 100%. This is um, uh, attracts bees, and if you rub this, I bet you you can tell me what that smells like. I don't know. Maybe I'm not smelling it right. Um, it smells like minty. Well, it is in the mint family, but it's licorice. Oh, I didn't get that. <laughs> Today, we didn't see any monarchs because I think it's a little early, but we did see swallowtail caterpillars. That was the big one. The um, swallowtail butterfly likes to eat dill, and that's one of its um, favorite foods to eat. I thought all butterflies liked um, milkweed. So we have all these different butterflies and, and their, their larvae, but they're not eating the same thing. So they're not competing for the food, and they can live harmoniously like we should be doing. Inside there is a very smart caterpillar. It has actually made a cocoon out of the leaves. Whoa. Yeah, I remember, I remember you and told inside, about if you gently open one of them, maybe you can open up this one. Just real gently, Maggie. You will see I was thinking a little that. black caterpillar, and I believe it's a painted lady. The garden has been brought great joy to PB Smith, and when we first um, were charged with coming up with a mission statement for our school and our students, um, one part of it is that each student is environmentally conscious. And so through Ecology Club and the use of our gardens and our outreach of Mrs. Denis in from kindergarten, preschool, through fifth grade, students become conscious of how butterflies and how the garden um, help our environment. So our hope is that it will continue and our love for the environment and what is happening here at PB Smith we hope to see go to every school at Fauquier County. Keeping bees in New York City might sound a little odd, but people have been keeping bees in New York City and in other cities in the world for a very long time. My name is Andrew Cote. I'm a beekeeper in New York City. Here we're on top of the New York Hilton Midtown, and we've got six beehives and they have a very short flight to 1,000 acres of beautiful flora in Central Park.
As far as beekeeping businesses go, we are modest and, and small in size, but what we lack in, in number of beehives, we make up for in spectacular locations. Generally mass-produced honey or mass-produced bread or mass-produced anything is not of the same high quality of a small craft brand, be that bread or beer or certainly honey. One of the biggest difficulties uh, with urban beekeeping is just the, uh, the element of dealing with, with people and the, the opportunity to educate them about bees and honeybees and their gentle nature is uh, a, a nice challenge, but a challenge. Most people, when they think of honeybees, they think of honey, and that's understandable because that's the product that they can taste and, and feel and see. But really, when we talk about honeybees, we're talking about pollination. One third to one half of all of the food on our plates is grown thanks to the labor of the honeybee. I help run a charity called Bees Without Borders, and via that charity, we travel all over the world, and recently we visited China. When I met the local beekeepers in the Hangzhou area, I was very impressed to see their methods of pollen collection and their methods of queen rearing, and we looked at their methods and compared them to our methods and found that they are more alike than different, but still I think we have something that we could learn from one another, so I, I look forward to returning and, and spending more time and getting to know them better. Actually, this is my only job. I'm probably the only full-time beekeeper in New York City. Or if there's another, I'd love to, to hire that person for a little help.